David, thank you very much for your welcome. Thank you for your reception. Um, can you hear at the back? You can all... Uh, thank you for coming. There seem to be friends from all sorts of stages of my life. Um, from when I came back to Devon in 1972. Anyway, there was Derek waiting for me, and uh, here he is tonight. So anyway, um, David did say I could sell the book, so there are a few copies there, and if you want them signed by the author, uh, that could be arranged. Anyway, let us begin. Mother Church always has a word for us. Every day, the Church sets out passages of Scripture for us to read and enjoy, and there is always a message. This evening, the New Testament reading for evening prayer is from Luke 22. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus tells the disciples, Get up and pray! so that you will not fall into temptation. Stay awake, pray, because you need it. Not me, says the Lord, not God, but you. You need it to come through the trouble and tests of being a human being. The title of this lecture is How to Maintain the Life of Faith in a Post-Christian World. Of course, I can only rarely talk about Christian faith, because that is all that I know anything about. It doesn't always stop the clergy, does it? Anyway. Um, but I must say two things. The only time I ever visited a mosque at Cordoba in Spain, I found it the most wonderful place to listen to God in. I could have sat there with Isaiah as my companion for as long as you like. And secondly, at the present time, 2011, in Britain, it seems to me there is no greater witness to the living God than the Chief Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. But, of course, we're mainly thinking about ourselves as Christians. To maintain the life of faith in a post-Christian world. Now, answers can sometimes be quite easy. The problem is usually the question. Understanding the question. So let's unpack it a bit. The question has three parts. A post-Christian world. Whoever dreamt up this title? Well, I can guess who did. Anyway, it is absurd, of course. Nothing can be post-Christian. Because God, Father, Son and Spirit is just as present and active in the world, just as busy creating his world as he ever has been. What we all mean, of course, is a post-Christendom Britain. And make no mistake about it, there has been a revolution. When I was ordained in 1967, most people in Britain would go along with saying that they were some sort of a Christian. Not so anymore. People are very suspicious of religious faith. And the Christian religion, as we all know, is in danger of being something which is indulged in by consenting adults in private. Now, faith for the Christian is faith in Jesus Christ, and it is a gift from God. I remember years ago at some meeting, an Irish Roman Catholic scholar saying, never look down on people who have not got the faith. There are people who say they wish they had faith. Because Christianity is such a beautiful thing. I remember my own philosophy tutor, a really committed agnostic, but a charming and helpful and lovely man, looking rather wistful and saying, just the same thing. It is such a beautiful thing, Christianity. And I'll come back to that point later. Going on about faith, in a certain novel, there is a character who comes to faith, kicking and screaming, and I venture to quote, the context is that she's been on a weekend for new converts, what some of the less mature, allegedly more mature Christians refer to as a clean weekend. Anyway, she says, they wanted us to go forward and invite Christ into our lives. 
Well, I don't know, but that seemed all back to front to me. It's Christ who's just come into my life. There's nothing I can do about it, even if I wanted to. Jesus knows quite well what a slag I've been, but he still seems to want me. If we have the gift of faith, then we should every day thank God for it. And we have to work hard to maintain it. Paul tells us that we should stir up the gift of the Spirit in us. Faith is a gift of the Holy Spirit. How do we stir it up? That is the question. Now the answer I'm going to try to give comes in two main parts with a postscript at the end. The answer to part one is very old and very conservative. Incidentally, do you remember the famous book review? Somebody uh, reviewing a book said, this book is both original and profound. Where it is profound, where it is original. No, where it is profound, it is not original. And where it is original, it is not profound. <laughs> Whether part two of what I've got to say is profound, you shall have to wait and see. But let's begin. Let's begin with a song, Negro Spiritual. You can't get to heaven in an old Ford car, won't get that far. You can't get to heaven on roller skates, you roll right past them pearly gates. In other words, the life of faith is going to cost us an effort. We need to make the effort. We need to make the effort to go to church. It seems an obvious thing to say, but it needs to be shrieked out at every Anglican on every opportunity. We need to make the effort to go to church. It's not actually the most important thing, but we may as well begin there. God has given us sacraments, so let's use them. Let's break bread in memory of the resurrection of Christ on the resurrection day. That's what it's given to us for. If the Jesus service is not possible, then there are plenty of others. And going on holiday nowadays to Scotland, I have got rather a taste for long and passionate Presbyterian sermons. Because public worship is where the church is realised. The people become what they are and are seen to be what they are. We look all pretty ordinary. You know, on the very best of days, we look pretty ordinary. But we are, in fact, the assembly of the firstborn. We are the mystical body of Christ. And sometimes people say they don't get anything out of church. Well, it is worth remembering that if you are in church, a lot of other people, the rest of the congregation, the church worldwide, the world, God Almighty, get a lot out of you being there. Because you strengthen them. But public worship is where we realise that we are already sharing the life of God. That's what I think public worship is. It's sharing the life of God or learning to share in the life of God. We are being taken forward to heaven. We realise it because we make it happen, or rather God makes it happen in us. We realise it because that is when we are consciously aware of who we are altogether. Daughters and sons of God, sisters and brothers of Christ. And faith is that awareness. What we do on our own, it seems to me, is even more important. Because each soul, each of us, has a unique relationship with Almighty God through Christ in the power of the Spirit. And what do we do about that every day? That is the question I ask my high church sister on occasions because she sneers at uh, rather low church people like her evangelical goddaughter who's always snooping off so I've got to go off and have my, my quiet time. So I say to my sister, well, what do you do? I won't. Well, you can speculate what the answer might be. Um, and of course, that is one reason why the evangelical wing of our church is taking over. Because they have this marvellous discipline of the quiet time. 
And actually, of course, it isn't really a discipline. Because we, the Christian, we always get far more out of any form of prayer that we may go in for than we ever put in. And every time of prayer is an opportunity for joy. I mustn't get too preachy about this because I'm lucky I've had all the opportunities in terms of time and a good place to pray in and all that, I know. But I do challenge, if we're going to maintain the life of faith, every Christian to think about their life of prayer, their private prayer. Time is scarce, we know that. We've got all these time and labour saving devices and what happens? Isn't it Satan's victory or one of them? We've got no time. Well, we all sit in chapel. I, I remember a Roman Catholic friend of mine, this priest, says, oh well, if you're, if you're driving somewhere, put on a daisy tape, sing along with it, and that's your morning prayer done. Well, you know, at least it's something, isn't it? Um, so there are times when we've got to work out when we're going to pray. I would say, have I had time to do the crossword? Have I had time to do the sudoku? Then I've had time to pray. Priests, of course, have the discipline of the daily office, morning and evening prayer, together or privately. Sinner that I am, you'll not be surprised to know, I sometimes neglect it. Much more often, I say to myself, oh bloody hell, not Leviticus again. <laughs> Yet it is, when it's done, it is something which is done ultimately for the good of the entire world. If you and I are praying, it is something that is a contribution to the moving on into salvation of the entire world. And usually, of course, if you do you know, feed yourself on Psalms or Scriptures or whatever, particularly the Scriptures, then you are going to find, almost always, a sparkle of insight and a spice of joy, even in Leviticus. If I may quote from the book again, this is where the hero is on holiday, he gets caught by the swimming pool uh, trying to say even song. He's sitting there, sort of, you know, trying to become obtrusive with his Bible and his prayer book or whatever. And another character comes up and of course wants to know what he's doing, what are you reading, why are you doing that? Well, it's the work of a priest, why are you on holiday, why are you working? So, and he says this, well, this isn't work really, it's life. For me, it's about keeping a relationship going. And it's a bit about proving to myself that I am serious about God and Christ and so on. And of course, prayer on our own, like worship, our life. Because it's when we begin to be able to take up some of the life of God and let him in. We also need friends. I said this wasn't uh, particularly original. Um, we are told by St. Peter, no less, that our adversary, the devil, goeth about like a ravening lion, seeking whom he may devour. The sheep that strays from the flock is the first to get et. So we need the support of Christian friends. By which I mean people we are not embarrassed to talk to about the things of God. People we're not embarrassed to talk about the faith with. C.S. Lewis said it, the greatest of all non-conductors was embarrassment. So we need people where we feel they share enough of the faith for us to be able to say things without embarrassment. I say the things of God. Talk about the things of God. Not the things of the church. Oh, the quota, what was the bishop wear, and isn't the vicar awful, and all that. Normal sort of things that uh, congregations talk about. Um, but the things of God and Christ. So things like cell groups, prayer groups, support groups are important. So are trips, pilgrimages, anything that somehow focuses the mind on what we're committed to 
in our heart and life, in our, you know, our faith in Jesus Christ. And of course, it takes courage being a Christian. Because nowadays, we need the courage to be known to be different. And I might say a bit more about that. And it takes courage also in another way. I was very comforting um, when I heard that, being again a Scottish minister, a minister of the Church of Scotland, who said that people he came in contact with and wherever he was in Scotland seemed to have this terror of reading the Bible. Now it seemed to be good old Calvinist Protestant Scotland, but they should be terrified. Of, I was enormously comforted because <laughs> this is a disease that's afflicted English people for years. And every English home has a Bible, uh, but it's not been opened since 1888. <laughs> What's the use of that? I used to have a paperback one that I used to use on Bible Sunday, and it's all shaky about. And there's all sorts of bits of leaves and everything else, you know, used to fall about and everything else. So that's what your Bible ought to look like. It ought to be worn out. But we need to conquer that terror and to explore. Now, I've never forgotten what was said to me a long time ago by someone who was here tonight. Jill, you said how odd it was that when people took up a hobby, like golf or fishing or something like that, they wanted to get books and read out all about it. But it's you who said they never do that about the Christian faith and the church. Maybe, of course, it's because the wrong sort of books get written. Well, I'm working on that. <laughs> <laughs> Just as people perhaps don't have enough help about quiet times and all that. But as with the Bible, I think it's partly a deeper problem. And we need to solve it if we're going to maintain our life of faith, I think. Let's think about it like this. A child is taken to a show, to the theatre. We can remember that. Suppose, I've never been to see it, but cats would be a good example, because there's all that complicated engineering and choreography and all sorts of things. And the child, you or I, would be spellbound by the magic, and they find intense joy in it all. And they don't want to lose that joy. And they are afraid, I think, I think this is, applies to people in a way, they are afraid that knowing too much about the mechanics, seeing all the machinery, the nuts, the bolts, the singers, dancing singers and dancers, sweating and panting, all this may destroy that magic, destroy that joy. They're frightened, they may lose it. I think that may be sometimes why otherwise mature people in the church get worried about explanations and certainly get very worried, unreasonably worried about changes. But the thing is that child would not have any of that joy if it was not for the adults. Think of the theatre, the singers, the dancers, the, the writers, the engineers, the designers, the producers, the scene shifters, the electricians and everybody else. They feel magic. The writer wants to communicate some sort of magic. They feel the joy, but they just as much as the child, but they feel it in a more grown-up way. They have grown through the risk, through the bewilderment of seeing how it all works and seeing how all the machinery works behind the scenes. And they've moved on to a less fragile joy. Though the joy, of course, is always the same, because Christ is the joy. Well, that is all the sort of non-original stuff. We can't do without it. But it may be like that old Ford car. It may be profound and well-known, but it may not get us all the way to answering the question about maintaining the life of faith in the post-Christian world. 
But this new stuff may turn out to be like the roller skates. Very fine and new and flashy. But of course we may go right past them pearly gates. I hope not. So let's start with thinking about the church to which we belong, by faith and baptism. And another quotation here is relevant. From Groucho Marx. Because Groucho Marx famously said that he did not join any clubs because any club that would let him in was obviously not worth joining. <laughs> well, he took a very low view of himself, which in a way is refreshing because most people have a far too high view of themselves, don't they? Anyway, the church has let you and me in and made us welcome. That does not mean that it is not worth joining, but that it does mean that it will not be perfect, not if you or I are in it. And the point being that we should not make an idol out of the church, because an idol is something that comes between us and God. People get fed up with the church and they curse it for its faults and everything else, well, that's a problem that's at least as old as Moses and Aaron, if you think about it. So there's nothing new about that. So don't be put off by the awfulness of the church. Certainly not by the awfulness of the clergy. Actually, when people, very kind, generous people, sometimes used to point out my awfulness to me, um, I used to say, well, I'd probably be less, less awful and let you down and really be less contemptible if you prayed for me. Have you prayed for me this week? That shut them up. <laughs> anyway, faith is in, this is something I think that's important for us all to see. Faith is not sectarian. Faith is in God through Christ in the power of the Spirit. And I get worried by people who say, you know, that, they, that they're intent on making sure that they're really fully Catholic or really sound evangelicals or other people who want to make sure that everybody who comes into the church is already perfect and they won't be contaminated um, before they're ever allowed in because false images of what the church is uh, can come between us and God the best image for the church really is the ark isn't it? Uh, the Noah's ark which is full of all manner of beasts Yet they're all brought to salvation. False images of the church may hamper us. So may false images of humanity. Humanity is fallen, we know that, and I think it is fallen in the sense that it is not yet made perfect, not yet ready or able to share in the life of God. But it is true that humanity outside the kingdom is still or already doing a lot of the work of the kingdom. God is at work out there and getting a response from people already. Let me illustrate. I'm going to boast. I'm going to boast because I now read The Independent. I'm very conceited about that because I gave up the Times about a fortnight before all this uh, you know, <laughs> nonsense about uh, phone hacking and everything by the Murdoch press burst on the world. So I'm feeling very smug. Anyway, I'm feeling less smug because the Independent has challenged its readers to give a day's pay for Africa. The Independent is a, a very secularist paper. It's very critical of the Christian church in all its manifestations. But it said, let everybody give a day's pay for Africa. And they have received millions. I've got to send off my contribution. I've calculated that it'll be about the equivalent of ten bottles of wine. That's all. At all. (laughs) 
Last week or the week before, I was staying in a village in Surrey, where the, the village shop, it's quite a big and prosperous village, but the village shop always seems to be sort of, you know, the spa, always seems to be uh, thriving, and it's kept by uh, a shopkeeper who clearly his ancestors came from the Indian subcontinent. And I'm told by my friend who lives there that this man gives 1% of all his takings to charity. Now, before he's paid any taxes, paid any bills, paid for his supplies, paid his workers, anything. Everything that goes through his till, 1% goes to charity. Recently, he marched up, apparently, to the village school, church school, and handed them a cheque for £10,000. Because he felt that was the right thing to do. Anyway, that's what he did. They said, of course, he wants his children. So he's quite young, quite new in the business. His children are not yet old enough to go to the school. And obviously, he's hoping that it'll be a nice, good school when he gets there. There's a bit of it there, but he gave a check for £10,000. I can tell that you can't imagine <laughs> anybody doing that. Um, I asked my friend, I said, well, you know, what's he believe? If you're an Indian, they're much more likely to be a Christian than, than or an active Christian than, than, than an Anglo Saxon uh, Englishman. And uh, he said, no, 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 he got class marks, he's a Hindu. There is idealism about, there is generosity and a desire to make sacrifices for the good of all. People see the point of loving and being loved. People see the point about being stewards or whatever of the environment. And sometimes they're very evangelical with a small e about the environment. All these good things are happening. We should not be surprised because all men and women are made in the image of God. However, having said all that, there are still images of humanity that have to be challenged and exposed. And that, I think, is what we all want to do. It seems to me that the life of faith today must include having a very special view of the world that is different from the world's own view of itself. Now when I typed that, I thought that's rather good, so I'm going to say it again. <laughs> the life of faith today must include having a very special view of the world that is different from the world's own view of itself. Because the world's view of itself, you know, as given to us by our culture at the moment, is shaped by Charles Darwin, Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, who all say that we are more or less determined in the grip of forces that we find difficult to avoid or subdue in the case of Freud. You know, there once was a man who said, damn, it seems to me now that I am. Just a being that moves in predestinate grooves, grooves, not a bus, not a car, but a tram. That's pretty good off the top of my head. <laughs> um, but now we also have market forces. We have this great worship of market forces and their great apostles. Until, of course, <laughs> people fall victim to market forces and then hear them squeal. But anyway. Um, but anyway, market forces, the whole doctrine seems to say that none of us have any value or significance except as con consumers, that no one is motivated by anything but profit. May I quote the book again? Because the very modern young lady says, I can't remember, apropos of some party or something, uh, she says, once upon a time, Liv, that's her friend, Liv and I would have gone along with it. A few drinks, a few spliffs, and end up in bed. It was all supposed to be such wonderful fun. Is there a touch of wistful regret on the part of the author there? Anyway, the Christian today has to live in the world and challenge the world. We have to have a coherent way of challenging the world for the world's sake. It's the world that Christ came to save out of love. And we need to think out the gospel view of humanity and we need to live it. 
Well, I suppose I don't need to tell you that the gospel view of humanity is that every single individual is made in God's image and is precious to him. So a man or a woman is not an economic unit to be paid off and exploited, not a consumer to be milked, not someone who is useful because they buy endless piles of stuff and keep the economy turning over and your pension and mine paying out. There's more to it than that. A human being is valuable even when he or she is weak and vulnerable. So we don't kill babies in the womb, nor do we send our own folks off on a one-way trip to Switzerland. I must say I've got a bit more of a, a, a sort of vested interest in all that. But get rid of them simply because it's more tidy and uh, they spoil our fun and everything. Uh, I don't like to think of my children looking for, you know, flights to Zurich or anything like that. A human being, as we're finding out, is too valuable to be deprived of education because we can't afford it or because we don't believe it or we won't make the effort somehow to teach them. They're too valuable to be deprived of an education so that they can't have the dignity of a job, even if we could spare the cash to pay them for it. And human beings, is what I learnt in ministry in this city, deserve to be saved from seeing themselves always as victims. Oh no, we're the poor. We should have stuff given to us. Above all, of course, human beings deserve a better and a higher view of themselves than those words of mine put into the, the, the mouth of, of, of the character Leah. A few drinks, a few spliffs, and then end up in bed. Human beings need to be delivered from the great lie that that is all that life has to offer in the way of joy. And the lies that we get fed. Uh, just yesterday, my friend Joy here was saying that there's some advert about a BMW car, is it? Yes. Is it Joy is having a BMW car? Well, some people are easily pleased, I suppose. You know. <laughs> I enjoy having a car, but well, anyway, I, what an awful lie. And also some politician yesterday, can't remember who, a very eminent member of the government, said, of course, it's wonderful, the Olympic Games are coming in under budget. Well, their budget originally was three million. So far, they've cost nine million. Why should you stand up and tell a lie like that? And say, hey, <laughs> you know, we just all take it, don't we? We need sometimes to be challenging. That's what the church should be for. That's why we need to have a coherent view of what humanity is for. And this is the nub of really what I'm going to say about the life of faith in the modern world. The end is in sight, don't despair. Um, Christians have to think out a gospel view that challenges all the current orthodoxies, nearly all of them. Particularly, as we've seen with these youngsters and so on, the tyranny of peer pressure. The only standard of conduct that young people have is what their mates do. Somebody, some guru, very sensibly was saying on the radio this morning or yesterday morning, um, I always listen to these things while shading and nearly cut my throat because I get too angry. But anyway, Somebody was saying that the only place where a lot of children find security, acceptance, dare one say love, is in the gang and with their peer group. And so they're going to do what their mates do. Anyway, let's go on. The tyranny of the market we need to challenge. This doctrine that the only standard of value is money another occasion I got very irate I was listening to someone talking on the radio about the need to maintain open spaces, green parks and gardens and so on, municipal gardens open spaces need to, to, to do that. And he's trying to communicate with the people who spend our taxes and he was saying the only way he could communicate with them or get his point over was by saying that of course having parks 
and gardens saves money. It was the only language that he could find for those who spend taxes and those who pay their taxes and elect the others, uh, how they could understand the value of a green field or a rose bed. It seemed to be the only language that it was money. The only language that people could understand that. Well, don't we have to challenge that? But all of it, of course, is hot air, as I said, uh, unless we live it. It seems to me Britain is full of people, rather like you and me, who've got a certain amount of middle class guilt and sit around and say, oh, isn't it awful? And it's all our own fault, and we're all guilty and all that. Um, but very little gets done. I did say a long time ago that the Olympic Games would never take place. And I thought to myself happily a few weeks ago, um, because we've lost the ability to do it somehow. We all sit around and talk and have reports and committees and all sorts of people. We all get paid a lot of money and we all elect them and they're all wonderful. Absolutely nothing happens, you know. <laughs> Um, anyway, I thought they're not going to happen. Well, I don't, I'm not so sure now. Because I thought I'd been proved wrong a few weeks ago. Everyone was going swimmingly. And now we can see that we have not lost our capacity for making a foul up out of anything. But that's part of the paralysis of people who don't know what they're doing, not that don't know what they're doing it for, and so on, who need a more coherent and a more God-given, a more Bible-based, a more spirit-filled view of what they're trying to do. Uh, there are all sorts of people who, 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 who can see the problem and want to do something, but they don't actually ever do it. That's why we need to live our view of humanity. Um, and when people get together and do something, it's amazing what does happen. Because the hospice movement, for instance, is one of them. That is a largely Christian-based organisation. It's a Christian view of death, like we're not scared about it, or we're not scared to talk about it, because we have a view about death. And see how that is possible. People can make a difference. Amazing things do happen. The effort is worthwhile. That, of course, is a gospel truth. That is what the resurrection of Christ means. <coughs> but the effort to do good and to get things right is worth it. And we have to trust Christ and his spirit. And when people do, amazing things do happen. Much earlier, I talked about people who thought that the Christian faith was very beautiful, but somehow could not bring themselves to believe in it. I said I'd come back to that. I would want to say now to people like that, I'd want to say, well, look, you think it's very beautiful, trust that sense of beauty. Trust that. Don't worry too much about, you know, the Chalcedonian definition and the Nicene Creed, and certainly not the, the, the Athanasian Creed. But don't worry too much about that. Trust beauty. You also, I can't believe in God. I said, well, put another monosyllable in place. Can you believe in love? Can you believe in life? Then, of course, they might say, but I don't find any of that in our churches. But anyway, that's another problem. But I always want to say to people, look, if you do that, if you trust, then God will give you, you will receive the sign that you need. Because faith feeds on itself. Or God sort of somehow makes feed, makes, uses our faith to make it grow. The more we trust God, the more we become able to trust God, the more faith we have. Let's end there, almost. Because Jesus, this is the postscript, Jesus called people to put their trust in the good news. Mark 1, 14. The time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven has drawn near, put your trust in the good news. That's a more useful word, trust. Put your trust in Jesus, who is risen from the dead. I took a very long time, about 40 minutes ago,
defining the question, how do we make the question, how do we maintain the life of faith? Well, following the very highest example, I will end now with another question. What or who do we really put our trust in? Thank you very much, Mark, for a very interesting, thought-provoking talk. Um, are you happy to take some questions here? Oh, yes. If yes. anybody has any questions, <laughs> uh, Mark will come to you. We can take a few questions now, and then there'll be a chance to talk more informally over refreshments at the end. Yes. I feel sorry for having to sit on, on church pews. They are at least more comfortable than the pews in St Andrew's Care, which will be designed by the Pentateuch position. Anyway, anyone want to say rubbish or whatever? Uh, part of the problem with um, giving to Africa, which I know we're all supposed to lo love doing, right? Yes. Um, is the situation, I mean, people have actually given to the starving in Africa, certainly to my knowledge, since the 1940s. All right, it's a huge... Um, huge situation um, and I will feed the hungry, um, you know, yeah. no problem. But what I do find difficult is that that money then goes into that state system. From feeding the poor, that money is then convoluted, as it were, into government money, yes. which is often used to feed an army which then keeps the people down. Yeah. And um, I cannot see any way of getting over that. I mean, this is what has happened in my lifetime, yes. looking at the situation in Africa. And I don't quite know what you um, think about that. I mean, you are going to give your money to Africa. Are we giving to feed the poor, or are we giving yeah. to actually um, feed an army to keep the people down? All oh, right, so I think that is a problem. I'm going to get to Africa, I don't see why all these heathens I mean, <laughs> should be worse, I mean, it should be better at giving than we who all sort of every time we say we have to give everything and we go and worship Jesus who says give away absolutely every single thing you have uh, and we are programmed to be giving. So why should all these people who don't believe in it be better at it than us who say we are? That's why I, I want to show those. <laughs> show those, show those heathens. Yes. Uh, well, uh, well, they're not, uh, that, I think I've said the lecture, you know, they're, they're, they're very wonderful people. Uh, but uh, that's probably why. I think it is a problem. But I, I'm very, very suspicious. I'm sorry, I, I, I know you speak from experience, and, and you don't look to be in the least bit like uh, a mean person, but I'm ever fed up with people with an enormous amount of wealth who say, oh, no, I don't believe that. It's very easy to find excuses. Oh, yes, it's not an excuse. No, I know it's not. Um, I know it's not. Uh, you don't look that sort A genuine person. sort of question no. about one's motives in, yeah. in, in these Oh, yes, I think, you're, I think you're quite right. And plenty of other things. Heaven only knows. Yeah. No, I'll yeah. I'm laughing because I'm hurt. Yeah. Um, I absolutely agree totally that Christians need to read the Bible. Yes. Um, but I can't help noticing, as I go to morning prayer most, most mornings, that every few weeks it comes back in the cycle of Psalms of all the nasty, horrible things yes. that we're going to do to our enemies, such as dashing a little child against yes. them. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I find, especially with the person coming in who doesn't yes. do, totally embarrassing. Yes. Well, I think it is that we need to be a bit. I think that if. Uh, um, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd live to say this. I don't know what my clerical friends would say. But I think we can get too many psalms. <laughs> have too much of them. There are beautiful uh, other canticles in, in, in uh, Common Prayer, there are wonderful. Old Testament canticles, New Testament canticles. I think we should use the hymn book as well. And if you find um, psalms difficult, um, well then, forget about it. The only, the only other thing about psalms is, of course, that that's what Jesus lived on. And it's called a bush. Yes, or it's shared bush. Yes, yes, that's right. Yeah. 
I want, it's funny, you learn certain words you mustn't use from the pulpit, you know. Ignorant is one of them. Because people go, oh, I'll, I'll spend ignorant. They say, no, what I, I said that once, you know, you're all ignorant. Which I mean, they don't know. It's a fact. But people were very iffy about calling them ignorant. And the other word is, is in common. We're not common. People down the road are common. Um, <laughs> so I'd say share. But uh, yes. Um, on the other hand, I can remember being taught at college that those feelings, we most of us have those feelings some of the time. And if I'd seen my children or grandchildren treated like that, you know, I might feel... All right, I know if I have those feelings, I'm supposed to pray against them, I'm to be honest. Uh, but, yes, well, you know, do, do what helps you. Uh, and the Bible, of course, I would say is a, is a progressive thing. You know, what was fine in the days of, I don't know, Samson, got a bit irritated with the people, so he slew them. Uh, won't do for us who had Jesus is a, that won't do, you know, we mustn't do that uh, I always remember a uh, sorry, sir. yes sir why do you think the Church of England always shoots itself in the foot like we haven't had a brilliant archbishop who could be at the Dumbledore explaining the magic and mystery of the faith to so many people, particularly young people spend all this time We mustn't worry if the rich people say sod that. <laughs> Indeed, that would be a compliment, really. At least you have to spend time raising money instead of as great as possible. Well, the fact that money is raised is a sign of the gospel. The fact that people shared all that they had at the feeding of the 5,000 was a great sign of the kingdom breaking in. The fact that... Uh, by and large, the church people of Devon now pay 100% of the salaries of the, and, and all the on costs of the active clergy. I can remember saying 20 years ago, having lived in Devon all my life, you don't know what Devon's like, it'll never ever happen. But it has. So, you know, it can be a sign. We need, yeah, but coming back to a problem about, I know, why does the church agree? I know. Well, of course, the church of Jesus Christ much less the kingdom, is a bit more than the Church of England. Um, I agree. I feel rather like the great Bishop Gore, Bishop of Oxford, who was about observed on Westminster Bridge, coming out of a meeting of bishops at Lambeth Palace, stopping halfway across, shaking his fist <laughs> at, it's about 1926, just before he retired, shaking his fist at Lambeth Palace and saying, I hate the Church of England. He said, well, you know, it... it, it <laughs> If a lot of people say that, you know, you take that for granted. But if the Bishop of Oxford says that, <laughs> you know, you've got a bit of a problem. Um, I don't know. I suppose there are wiser people than I who have different priorities. I'd be interested to see what the church's response is to all these events uh, in London. We should pray, I think, for the Bishop of London and the equivalent people uh, to get it right. But, uh, anyway... I don't know. Because you and I aren't in charge. <laughs> um, but there seem to be opportunities, there seem to be moments uh, when something could be done. The Church Urban Fund, oddly enough, was a, uh, was a bit of a sign. Of course, the media won't write up any success stories about the Church. Certainly not the Church of England. But Mrs. Thatcher said to Runcie, you know, well, shut up about, you know, if you're so keen about all these poor people, then going, nah, 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 me, go and do something yourself. So he said, right, so I'll do I'll go and do it. And he did. Um, but she, you know. Mark. Oh, yes. Um, I've been challenged over the last six months in reading a book which um, 
was very much emphasised it's the personal and Christianity that we are persons because we're loved by God. You don't become a person because your mother is loving you, though that is very, very important, but that actually you are already a person in the womb. You know, it's actually saying that your person is because you're loved by God. And he, he uses that to show a whole way through life we build up all our defences often because we've not been loved. Okay. And, and that's been a challenge to me thinking, you know, viewing people. But he also has a great critique of the church um, for its failure, and failure. And one of its failure he feels is on the Eucharist, that we're not seeing it as part of being the body of Christ praying, that actually we're there to be praying for the world. And, and proclaiming, you know, um, do this in remembrance, you know, so that others can see and come to faith. And I, I found that a real challenge. Yes. Um, in a multi of things. And I just sort of wondered how you do some of those things. As well. And I quite agree that we have to challenge the kind of orthodoxies. Oh, yes. One of the things that I get frustrated with is these you know, wonderful programs on television, you know, there's been this wonderful mathematician doing all the beauty of patterns and things. Mm. But very much saying, you know, I don't believe. And then they're going to show all the beauty in the world. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God, you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of questions there. Mm. Uh, <laughs> I haven't come across this idea that uh, um, somebody is a person because, because God loves them. And that may be the difference between a human and an animal. And uh, the other side of saying that human beings are made in the image of God. Um, certainly, that in proclaiming salvation as we enact the Eucharist, we should be praying for the world. Um, there have been times when, very profoundly, people who are very close to me who do not have the faith, and they're there in church, and there have been times when I've said, Lord, not me, not me this time, not me, them, them, please. Um, but that's to do with my own guilt feelings about my children and so on. But, uh, uh, well, yes, we certainly should be praying for the entire... If, if we did that and say, you know, please, Lord, convert the whole world, beginning with Great Britain, and beginning with Devon, and beginning with Exeter, and beginning with some friends. Now, who can we convert... <laughs> Or say, Lord, you know who you're trying to convert this week. Please send us to help them. That would be a bit of a challenge, wouldn't it? And of course, <laughs> helping them probably won't be rushing up to them and saying, have you taken the Lord Jesus into your heart? Not that I wish to belittle the people who work on those lines, because they are the only people who have much success in them. But um, they're far too good at, at making converts. Um, but very often, not putting pressure on and just smiling and being helpful. I'm always worried about somebody saying, I don't know, this is not really answering your question, but I'm going to say it anyway. I've always been worried by somebody who said, I much prefer my non-Christian friends to my Christian friends, because my Christian friends are always trying to get me to do something I don't want to do. You know. <laughs> And I'm just being loved so that they can get brownie points for converting me. But I think people pick that up quite. Uh, looking back on my own ministry, I think I used to sort of follow up people and so on. Of course, what he's trying to do is get me to come to church, you know. And they're quite right, too. But, uh, you know, the reason for that was because I, part of me, just wanted to see lots of people in church <laughs> and get the brownie points. <laughs> um, but we need, we need all those encouragements, and that's why we need other people to be sort of critical and support us. Um. I think sometimes the very evangelical view of, you know, come and be saved, which I have come across quite often with people I meet who have come out of prison. Mm. Now, often they have gone to prison with no faith at all. Yes. Um, they then come across uh, prison chaplaincy and other bits of that sort, you know, um, within that sort of team thing. Yes. And they get a very evangelical view. Uh, I mean, I'm not 
deprive that in one mm. sense, but what I'm asking you really is, um, they come out, they may say to me, you know, the sort of I am saved bit, which I say sort of fair enough, because, yeah. I mean, you know. What sometimes happens though, um, say they've been on drugs, say mm. they um, ha are alcoholic basically, and those are the things that have taken them mm. into prison, right? They then fall, they go back to drinking, or they go back to drugs, right? Mm. And they, have, they seem to have this view of right, um, a black and white view, which I think is often a male view rather than a female, but you know, we um, yeah, will. We, we will forgive See you for your sexism. <laughs> yes, but it's only meant to sort of... Uh, no, you speak it now, I have. Sorry, I, I, I'm pulling on this. But I do find that they then um, sort of fall away totally in a kind yes. of way because there is no in-between, there is no sort of feeling yes. that you can fall and yet the, the idea of... Um, yes. Having, yes, it leads to despair, having, having yes. fallen with no way back, or, yes. or the idea that one can be... Uh, some of you will correct me. I never thought I'd stand in this church of all churches and quote Martin Luther, but similar you're still set the at the same time justified in the sinner. Which seems to me just a merely statement of where I am, I think, perhaps everybody else is. But we're all, you know, we do, don't get everything right all the time. I think it's terribly difficult. I think people have... I just shudder to think what the experience of somebody who's been converted in prison yeah. would be about coming in most of our church. You know, how they're going to find the kind of support that they need. Because people are so, their life experience and everything about them is so different. Would you find people coming in? Well, I don't know. I just wonder yeah. what on earth is going to happen, you know, if people are. And I think wonderful work is done by them. Any of you know a man who lives in this town called Bill Hill, who I think is a Pentecostalist? He's the most marvellous person. With a great love for the lost. Uh, uh, I just wish he was an Anglican, but that, is all. that doesn't matter, does it? He does wonderful work for the kingdom. Um, just, uh, just as... Uh, Oh, they look as if they wanted to go and have tea, but I'm just going to end on a note of challenge, because a lot of the trouble that's been going on is about disaffected communities, and it is a fact, and I don't want to say this critically, that things are worse, or they seem to be a big part of those disaffected communities is when they have a large number of Afro-Caribbean people there. That's just a fact. And if you look back, the Afro-Caribbean people came here in 1950, and then onwards, most of them were very devout Anglicans and Methodists. And what kind of reception did they receive in our churches? You know, um, it's easy to say they got it wrong, but uh, <laughs> before we get too <laughs> sort of steamed up, you know, <laughs> we need to be a little bit more coherent in our thinking about how we make people welcome. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for sitting so. Thanks for letting me come. Thanks for making me think. Thank you. So, so thank you once again for your talk and for answering questions. And as you said earlier, you have some of your books available at the back if people would like to go and look at them and get them signed and perhaps ask any more questions. And um, thank you all for coming. It's lovely to see so many people here. Uh, we do have a donations pot on the way out. Uh, if you feel you were able to give us any donations to keep these lectures going, it would be very much appreciated. And um, please do stay for tea and coffee. Thank you. So it's our appreciation for that. It's a lo lovely thing to clap. We ought to clap every Sunday morning, not, really. not, not the vicar or the sermon. Just clap God. <laughs> well, he hasn't. <laughs>